Well, thank you for joining us today. We are excited to talk with Tiana Raymond about, from the BRIT about natural history collections, conservation and community science. Please post any questions you have for her in the chat and we will get to them at the end of the program. So I'd like to start with introducing Tiana. She is the collections manager at the Phila Coffee Herbert, her, I should have asked you how to say some of these words, <laughs> at the Botanical Research Institute of Texas here in Fort Worth. She facilitates the care, usage, and growth of this scientific plant collection, which houses 1.4 specimens, making it the 10th largest herbarium in the United States. She continues to be an active field botanist and has contributed to specimens, has contributed specimens to the herbarium from floristics projects in Texas, Peru, Costa Rica, and Jamaica. Her current projects include the curation and digitization of herbarium specimens, spe specimens for the four Natural Science Foundation grants. So Tiana, welcome. We're so glad to have you. I am gonna turn it over to you and I will come back at the end for audience questions. Wonderful, thank you, Jen, very much. All right, I'm gonna share my screen, so let me know if you can see it. Right. You're good. Thank you very much, I appreciate that verbal. I'm, I'm trying to organize my screen so that I see everyone here. So first, thank you very much, Jen, and to the Fort Worth Public Library for having me here today. Um, it's pretty exciting, in five days, we get to celebrate Earth Day on, on April 22nd, a pretty big and important day. And if you were part of the Fort Worth Public Library series, um, Last week, you had the opportunity to hear uh, Native Plant Society of Texas President Kim Conroe give a really compelling, moving presentation about, um, about our planet and our, our uh, responsibility as stewards for that planet um, and how one way you can do this is to honor your sense of place, your natural heritage um, with native plants. Um, and she showed us some pretty amazing native plant images that I'm sure uh, probably overwhelmed everybody, but also got everyone interested. And we're gearing up to the native plant sales season. So, um, so make sure you go to those websites she listed um, to find your own native plants to plant in your gardens or pots or whatever you have. So today, um, I'm going to be talking to you, um, hopefully a slightly different angle on maybe other conservation and Earth Day presentations you've heard before. My title is Collections, Conservation and Community Science, a collaboration to conserve our planet's natural heritage. What I'll really talk about today is the relationship um, between natural history collections and the communities that support them, that participate in them, and how those two things work towards conservation. Towards the very end of my presentation, or the last bit of my presentation, we'll be giving you two tools that you can use um, without, uh, without, any, without paying anything, that you can start participating in this, um, in this collaboration for conservation. So on this front image, you are looking on the far left at a herbarium specimen. So this is what I uh, work and curate. Um, well, the majority of them look like this. This is a, a herbarium specimen. Herbarium is a collection of plants. You'll hear more about it later. And then in the middle of this image, you can see um, some of our volunteers and interns uh, crowding around Joe Lippert, who's one of our herbarium staff members. And they're just in awe over this um, preserved plant specimen that was actually collected in China. And uh, they're looking at the label, which happens to be in Chinese, but also has um, uh, Latin characters for the scientific name of the plant. And then on the far right, this is uh, something you'll hear about as well. Uh, this is an image taken from iNaturalist. It was taken by Don Young at the Tandy Hills um, Natural Area, just east of Fort Worth, and uh, a pretty incredible early spring observation of a plant that, that he'd not seen um, growing there before. So with that, let me advance the slide. And this is where I am talking to you from. I recognize some of you might not be here in Fort Worth, Texas in the United States, um, but I work for the Fort Worth Botanic Garden and the Botanical Research Institute of Texas. So throughout my presentation, you may hear me go back and forth between Brit and the gardens, uh, but please know I'm talking about one, one institution located in Fort Worth in the cultural district. You can see a satellite image from Google on the bottom left hand of this screen. Um, and then zoomed in on that big circular 
cut out, you're looking at a picture of the building in which I work, where the collections I work with are. So that red arrow is pointing to a building that has solar cylinders on top of it. And that's what we call our archive block. It has our herbarium, our scientific plant collection, and it has our library, which is also uh, open by appointment. There are special COVID rules for any visits to, to our campus, make sure you check our website. Um, but the, it, the thing I'd like to, to point out on this image is you'll notice that that building that the red arrow is pointing to, it's one part of an L. It looks like the short end of an L um, that's sort of askew and upside down. But the cool thing about this picture is that that long edge of the L, um, you almost can't see it. And um, that is a living roof, a 20,000 square foot living roof that we have sitting atop what we call the think block of our building, of the Brit building. And, um, and it is installed with, a, uh, with native plants that are, um, that are components of an ecosystem, of a habitat that is local um, and that, isn't, that is you know, at risk. Um, this is, uh, these are prairie barrens. These are areas that have very shallow soils that, ex that, that uh, experience extreme temperatures um, and, and water and moisture regimes, which is really ideal when you think about it for putting on a roof because you don't really want to weigh down a roof with lots of soil and plants that have very deep roots. Um, so I enjoy seeing this in the way that building is camouflaged, especially when you look at um, the large urban sprawl that you see in the rest of our city. Although we're fortunate to have the garden right here, as well as the Trinity Trails and all those um, all those things. So this is what I'm going to talk about today that some of you may not be um, as familiar with, but perhaps you are. And if you are, I applaud you. And I, I hope that you'll contribute or, or make some comments in the chat. Um, but I'm going to be talking about natural history collections or, or natural science collections. Um, these are repositories of non-living specimens that, are, that have associated data that place that object in space and time. And I'll talk about the importance of that as we go. But the reason I've put this image in here, and it's not my image, this, um, this composite of images comes from a publication that just came out at the end of last year. This publication is entitled Biological Collections Ensuring Critical Research and Education for the 21st Century. This was put out by the Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, and it really highlights the importance of these biological collections, which, are not, which can be natural history collections, um, and their importance for, for everything we do in society, for conservation as well as research and education. Um, you can see uh, on the right-hand side of the screen, it'll tell you what some of those images are. Um, bottom left-hand corner, that's herbarium plants. That, that's where I work. But let's take it a little more locally. So where are these natural history collections um, located in our area? <clears throat> so I selectively sort of somewhat randomly chose natural history collections in some of our major cities here in the Metroplex. So the first one listed on the screen is University of Texas Arlington. Um, so in Arlington, the Amphibian and Reptile Diversity Research Center. They have a pretty amazing collection there. Um, and so I would recommend you go to their website if you'd like to learn more about them. Then we've also got the Schuler Museum of Paleontology in Dallas, Texas, um, at Southern Methodist University. Uh, and as you can see by, uh, by the dinosaur that's represented in that, in that icon, um, has a really interesting collection that goes back significantly in time. We've also got the um, Elm Fork Natural Heritage Museum, and that's Dr. Jim Kennedy, the curator of those collections at the Univers University of North Texas up in Denton. Um, you're looking at an image of pinned, dried, preserved uh, insect specimens in the bottom right-hand side, and then an image from their library's database online um, of a mussel, um, which is a, a very important collection that they have up there that has been digitized. So some pretty cool things happening here in our Metroplex. So I encourage you to Google these and find those locations. And of course, natural history collections, usually we're talking about documenting the natural history of our, our life here on, on our planet Earth. Um, but we've also got a pretty special collection at Texas Christian University here in Fort Worth, the Monic Meteorite Gallery, um, which is pretty incredible. And you can go to their website and find out a little bit more about these meteorites um, from other places. If you'd like to find other natural history collections on the left side of the screen, there's um, a screen capture of a website that you can go to to look up these other collections. So I'll pause just a second for you to take a camera photo if you like of this. However, I should say this presentation is recorded, so you'll have a chance to see this at some point later in time. 
But today I'm really talking about botanical collections because I have passions for all natural things, but, uh, but plants are where I, where I work and it's where a lot of my passions and concentrations lie. So where do you find these botanical collections? So the ones that really come to mind are actually relatively newer collections. These are bio repositories of seed and tissue collections. Some of the, uh, some of the more well-known are listed on the screen. We've got the Smithsonian's cryogenic uh, repository. We've got the National Center for Genetic Resources in Colorado. Um, we've got the Kew Millennium Seed Bank in England. And then we've got the Svalbard Global Seed Bank in Norway, um, which you probably have heard quite a bit about. Um, and then we've got, you know, a distributed system of smaller collections around, around the world in different institutions. And these are just two examples. We have the Brit Conservation Seed Lab and Seed Bank, which you'll hear about in a second. And then we have the Sumner Molecular and Structural Lab that has a tissue biorepository, um, which we maintain here in Fort Worth at um, Brit in the Gardens. So a little bit about our conservation seed bank, uh, seed lab and seed bank. This is taken from the website. Seed banks are one of multiple strategies conservations employ to protect plants. They serve as a source material for um, research on rare species, but more commonly they serve as a source for the reintroduction of plants into the wild. The Brit um, lab and bank is actually one of four institutions that are participating members of the Center for Plant Conservation, the United States Center for Plant Conservation. Um, and, um, and these are some of the others listed on that map of Texas. So the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, Mercer Botanic Center, and the San Antonio Botanical Garden. So you can go to their websites as well to find out a bit more information. And then just for you to have an idea of what it looks like in the lab and in the field um, on the top left or on the left side of this screen, you can actually see some images of uh, a rare plant that was being surveyed, a dahlia, a clover relative, and this was a par in partnership with the Texas Department of Transportation. So those are, uh, and then Brit researchers, Brit botanists, um, they're all in those yellow, uh, orange protective vests. We've also got, you know, there's a lot of work. There's the field work, there's bringing it back to the lab and there's that preservation all beyond that. And you're seeing those three steps here, the work in the lab. And then lastly, you're looking at those foil envelopes, which is how we preserve these in cool temperatures. So I want to show you a quick video um, that was just recently made by some of our field botanists. And so I'm gonna hit play and Jennifer, if there's problems with sound, please let me know. Hi, I'm Erin Flinchbaugh. This week I'm out here with Kim Shea from our press and Rachel Carmichael from our herbarium. And we're working on a project with Texas Trillium. The main purpose of this project is to verify the efficacy of a predictive habitat model. So basically what that means is we've been given a model that's identified hotspots where a species might be found. Now we visit those hotspots and if we find it, we say, great, the model works super well. And we collect data there to see what in that habitat actually made the species exist there. If the species doesn't exist there, we still collect data so that we can say, okay, here might be some holes in the model so we can improve it and make it better. This project is grant funded by the Texas Department of Transportation and Texas Parks and Wildlife. So we make sure when we're verifying places that we're verifying both roadsides and park habitats. Whenever we find our target species, we use a GPS to map where the exact members of the population are. This can help us establish what the dispersal is and what populations may be used for for research in the future, such as seed collection. Rachel is collecting one of the grasses we'll use that's a dominant in this habitat. We use it to verify our data later. The data we collect from this project can be used for several other conservation projects, including seed collection and population monitoring. All right, so hopefully you enjoyed um, you enjoyed that, which was uh, recorded relatively recently on a search for the Texas Trillium. And this is just a reminder that um, if you have any questions at any point, you can type them into the chat and we'll try to answer them at the end. I've numbered each slide so you can reference a slide number and we can go back to it if we need to. So. But this is, I've talked about all these different sorts of collections and even some of those collections here at Brit, but this is what I really want to talk to you about today. This is where I work, the herbarium, which is a collection of preserved botanical specimens that are systematically arranged for research and education. These are permanent, these are accessible. Um, those are very important components of this herbarium that we hold in public trust that holds these data um, that goes back over 200 years. 
and you're looking at three images from our herbarium. You're looking down the center aisle where you can see these compactor systems uh, that contain multiple cabinets down each aisle. And then you're looking at the inside of one of these cabinets. And then lastly, you're looking at a close up of the inside of one of these cabinets where you can see folders of the specimens we have. You'll notice there's a bit of a rainbow color in there. Um, we file our specimens taxonomically. So by what plant groups they belong to, um, but then we also file them geographically. So those colors represent the different geographies, the different regions of the world where those plants come from. So we do have plants from all over the world. Goodness. But this is what we're really essentially talking about. And although I'm talking about plants, you could sort of take this, expand this out to any of these natural history collections. Um, it is a scientific collection. If you've got um, the physical object, the plant preserved in some way, it may be dried and pressed like our herbarium specimens are, or they may be stored in liquid preservative um, or in deep freeze, like we've already talked about. But essentially that that object, that, that non, now, no longer living um, specimen has associated data. That data makes this a scientific collection. The data are typically found, at least on herbarium specimens on the bottom right-hand side of uh, the sheet. So you're looking at a piece of cardstock that's approximately 11 by 17. It's got the plant on there and it's got a bunch of labels, um, but the main label is the bottom right-hand corner and that's called the primary label. This is what documents the who, the what, the where, and the when. So this is where you find the name of the person who collected the plant, where that plant was collected, when that plant was collected, and then um, the identification of the plant. What is it? Um, you know, often people are very concerned about the identification of the plant and it is extremely important. I mean, we all know this, but it for a specimen that is properly collected, that has fruits and flowers and roots, that has all the elements required to identify all those elements that are diagnostic that tell you what species it is. If you have that, the physical plant on there, and you've got the label with the data about where and when it was collected and any other observations in the field, um, then that's how you identify it. Um, you can provide an identification later down the line. So the reason the specimen has a lot of labels is because researchers will use these for many years um, and they will re-look at these specimens over and over again with a, with a different understanding after publication of, of significant studies, after their own studies, after seeing specimens from other herbaria, and they will update the names of these plants, maybe because it was misidentified in the first place, um, maybe because our understanding of, of what species are in that group has changed. Um, so they may be doing some of that refinement. Um, this is a process. There are, you can take a screenshot or come back to look at this later, but I've kind of uh, identified some of the other parts of the of a typical herbarium specimen. Um, but this is the Philocology Herbarium. That is the name of, of our collection here in Fort Worth at, at Bread in the Gardens. And we have about 1.5 million, almost 1.5 million specimens, which does make, make us approximately the 10th largest um, herbarium in the, United, uh, in the United States. We have vascular plants, we have flowering plants, things like oaks, um, like blue bonnets, like pink ladies, um, some of the things you see flowering on the side of the road right now. But we also have bryophytes, so smaller things, um, things that you have to engage in belly botany, get down on your belly to look at, so mosses. Um, we have lichens, uh, which are symbioses. We have fungi and we have, so mushrooms, um, and we have algae but really it's also a supportive uh, community. So um, in our herbarium, in a, in a non-pandemic year, we have something like 25 to 30 volunteers that come in every week and help us with everything, with all aspects of what we do. We couldn't possibly do it without them. Um, so you're looking at pictures of pre-pandemic times in these images, but we'll hope to return to these. This has been a really interesting year for many natural history collections um, that have had to shift priorities. Some have had to close their doors. Um, we're fortunate that some of the activities I'm gonna show you today and some of the, the projects I'm gonna show you today um, have allowed us to keep going during this, this period um, and really engage people online in a way that doesn't put people at risk um, for their health. So, on a very basic level, these specimens are a way to identify plants and to, to record where they're distributed. This image on the left-hand side is a, a herbarium specimen, and it may or may not be familiar to you. If you're looking at all those live images in the middle of the screen, then you're probably thinking, I know that's a gay feather or a blazing star. I'm pretty sure I know what that is. 
But did you know that there's many species in that genus, in the genus Leatris, of those blazing stars? And the one on the left happens to represent a species that was first described as brand new to science right here from just west of Fort Worth by Ridgemar Mall. This species was discovered to be a bit different than the others in terms of flowering time, so when it flowered, and other aspects of morphology of the shape of, of, its, of its organs, of the flowers, of the leaves, that sort of thing. Um, and so it was the, the, the people that described this plant are Guy Neeson and Bob O'Kennan, both botanists um, with Brit, and they were able to say, hey, this is different from everything else. And how were they able to say that? Um, literature searches, so we're looking at other published studies, but also by consulting a herbarium. Because in a herbarium, you can take your specimen or your plant in question, and then you can look at all the other specimens of anything that looks like it's closely related to that, and you can start to make those comparisons. Um, and that becomes really, really important. And, you know, we're fortunate we have such a large herbarium here locally, but as I'll keep going, you'll hear me talk about the strategies we're using to make our collections more accessible to people that may not be residing right here in Fort Worth with access to our collections. Um, and on the far right of this slide, you're looking at a screen capture from the USDA plants database. This is the known distribution of Leatris estivalis, which is the summer gay feather, which is the, the new species that was um, described in 2001. You're looking at outlines of Texas and other states in the South Central United States. Um, and you'll see that there's counties in Texas that are painted green. That shows where there are observational data indicating the presence of that species. But you'll notice, well, there's a whole bunch of white space in between. Well, what's going on? Are they really not there? Or have we simply not recorded it? Um, and then Oklahoma, what's going on with Oklahoma? The whole thing is colored green, but no one county is colored. So it looks like maybe it's in Oklahoma, but, but we don't have those observational details to back that up. So herbaria, botanists, this is a form of evidence for us to document that what we say we saw, um, to document what we said we saw. So it has a species, location, and the date. These are often aggregated for general consumption through publications. We have uh, the Brit Press here, um, here at Brit in the gardens. And, and these specimens, they document the diversity. So all the differences and all the varieties, they document the diversity of a region. It provides these data that are very critical to conservation efforts, right? We can't conserve it unless we, we know it, unless we know what we're conserving. Why does it need to be conserved? Um, we have to prioritize and having these data, this basic base level baseline science to show us what is where um, and how long it's been there and how it's been changing allows us to make these conservation decisions. So you're looking at some of the publications that have come out from our press over the last few years. Um, we have a, a Cida Botanical Miscellany series. So that, those are some of the images you're seeing up there, Arroyo La Junta. Um, our publications are in English and Spanish, depending on the publication. Um, and then we've got a scientific journal, which is pictured on the bottom right. And you may notice the similarity between that and the, the, uh, the blazing star and gay feather images I showed you on the previous one. Um, so yes, that is the genus Leatris. And then in the top right, this is a huge project that's moving forward here at Brit. Um, this is the Illustrated Texas Flora's project. This relies on the herbarium heavily to know what species exist. Let's generate a list, um, not just a list, but let's give us also the tools to identify the plants that grow in different eco regions across Texas. We've got the North Central Texas flora, which was published in, I think, 19, 1999. And then we have the East Texas flora. You can see the first volume here, and we're currently working on the second and the third volumes. Um, I don't have a publication date for those yet, but please check our website for any updates there. There's an organization that helps advocate and, and group and, and um, marshal for natural history collections. It's called Spinach. They don't just deal with plants, but we the acronym is SPHN, uh, NHC, excuse me, um, which we fondly call Spinach. But they've got some really great resources on their website. So I have their link up here, and all these bullet points are taken from their website to just show you the um, the many different applications and impact these collections, these specimens can have. Um, economy and trade, 
to document changes over time, we're in the Anthropocene. So we're seeing human mediated changes in our environments. Um, and we're able to note those changes because we have this long history of data, these history of specimens along with other data um, that, that show us these changes, that document these changes, that allow us to start to make predictions about what will happen and um, how we can mitigate those changes in environmental quality, food and agriculture, public health and safety, national security, um, invasive species, scientific treasures. So the specimen, I didn't just throw this up here, um, just, just as a, a, a randomly, this specimen that you're looking at right now, you can probably tell that it's rather old because of the discoloration of the paper and maybe this handwriting, the script that's, um, that's visible on the primary label. But if I zoom into that label, then you may not be comfortable or familiar with the scientific name in here. So this is a Spidium arguetum. Oh, and by the way, Jen, um, something we always tell everyone and, and ourselves is to just pronounce it with confidence and no one will question you. And scientific names, um, can seem intimidating at first, but they're uh, they're pretty fun to, to work out and, and pronounce. But hopefully, as I've been jabbering along, you've had a closer look at that label and you've seen who collected it. So le legit is a Latin label for, for the collector. And if you follow after that and are able to discern what that script says, you'll see that it says John Muir, John Muir, 1875. If you're not familiar with John Muir, well, then this is perfect timing for Earth Day. Um, he's known as the father of national parks. He was a co-founder of the Sierra Club. He was a Scots American who, um, who very much advocated for conservation principles. Um, and that's an image from Wikipedia um, available of him. So I encourage you to explore a bit further. All right, so here's another project to take this back into kind of a little more recent history. Um, this is a project that happened within the last 10 years here at BRIT. Um, the PIs were Amanda Neal, a botanist at BRIT, and um, working with colleagues, many colleagues, but in particular, um, Patrick Lewis at the University of West Indies. And this project was in collaboration with the Fort Worth Zoo. So another local, um, another local organization engaged in conservation. And uh, this took place in Jamaica in the Hellshire Hills, which is outside of Kingston in the southern, southern part of the island. Um, and as we all know, islands are, are, are pretty important. Um, and high priorities for conservation. These islands have allowed speciation to occur. They've been isolated from other islands and allowed um, uh, distance from species um, in other places. And that's uh, one of those, you know, you can see the result of this. This is the Jamaican iguana. So on the bottom right-hand side of the screen, you're looking at the endemic endangered Jamaican iguana. It occurs nowhere else in the world. Part of the responsibilities for Brit was to create, to do a floristic inventory, an inventory of the flora, an inventory of the flowering plant vegetation, of the vegetation in this area in the Hellshire Hills. This is an area that exhibits um, many threats, um, uh, including introduction of, of, of cats, um, domestic cats, and many other organisms that can really uh, impact the survival of these iguanas. The Fort Worth Zoo is in collaboration with other organizations to, to um, to mitigate these, to raise these iguanas and release them at an age where they're less likely to be susceptible to some of these dangers. But our responsibility was to document the flora. So we collected herbarium specimens. We collected the fruiting herbarium specimens because, you know, if you want to conserve this organism, this Jamaican iguana, well, you have to know what are the parameters it requires for survival. One of those basic things is food and shelter. Plants, definitely comprise a significant uh, element in those things for the Jamaican iguana. So our collection of herbarium specimens and fruit and seed images was able to be, is able to be used as a reference for maybe scat collection for these iguanas. What are they eating? When are they, they eating those things? So it really opens up, these specimens make possible many other questions that can answer, you know, what do we need to ensure the survival of this species? Here's another project that is a currently funded project by the National Science Foundation led by Peter Fritsch. Um, and this one takes place in the Philippines. So the project is a four year project and it's funded by the National Science Foundation in the United States. And there are multiple institutions involved in the project. The lead uh, organization is the Botanical Research Institute of Texas. And there's also uh, the University of North Carolina at Wilmington with Darren Penny as the uh, co-principal investigator. 
and uh, Southern Illinois University at Carbondale, and that stands different as the old PI um, as part of that institution. Obviously, we have uh, the strong connection with Central Mindanao University as our main collaborator. Also, we'd like to uh, continue to strengthen our ties with other organizations in the Philippines. But of course, we have guests, um, guest researchers on the expeditions as well from various institutions. Conservation really is based on knowing what the organisms are. And so taxonomous role in conservation is discovering what the species are, trying to define what the species are. If we don't know what species are in an area, well, we can't protect those species and we don't have a good basis for protecting the area. Well, student training is a very important part of this project. And so in the grant, we actually have some fully funded uh, master's um, degree positions, and we're also training other students to come on the trips, those who are already uh, in a master's program or even undergraduates here in the Philippines. The photographic documentation has really been awesome. And after um, each single plant that we're documenting with an herbarium specimen is also getting documented photographically, those will be then connected to their metadata and made available through not just Coe's digital flora, but um, phytoimages and the Philippine plant portal. So hopefully you enjoyed that video. Um, it's a pretty exciting project that's happening. Um, right, so the project oh, is a four this. year. Um, pretty exciting project that's happening um, here at Brit right now, and especially exciting because they're, you know, aside from the originally obtaining the grant and then um, carrying out the field work, there's the next step, which is actually getting the specimens back into the United States. And that's the process where I've been involved on this grant. And I'm happy to, to note that after over a year of specimens um, not being able to be sent out of the Philippines because of COVID restrictions, movement restrictions, and the requirement of certain permits, um, I was able to retrieve uh, 10 boxes of thousands of specimens collected in the Philippines on this, uh, probably the same trip you were watching the video of um, from the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, their plant inspection station in Humble, Texas. So pretty exciting. There are a lot of permits and regulations that govern the basic collection of the specimens, the transport and movement within the country, the export, the import, um, and, and to make sure that these are all, you know, following in accordance with any um, international laws, the Nagoya Protocol from the Convention on the Biological Diversity, um, or CITES, which is uh, the Convention on the International Trade of Endangered Species. Um, above all, we collect to document these things, but not to hamper the future propagation or existence of these plants. Um, so conservation ethic and collecting is, is something very important. All right, let's see if I can pop over. And here's another great example from one of our researchers, um, Manuela Del Forno, Dr. Manuela Del Forno, um, who's a lichenologist here at BRIT. So these museum specimens have many uses of which I won't be able to get into all of them today, but I thought to show you some of these examples. So this is a DNA analysis of museum specimens. So um, I'll tell you a bit of the story behind this. This is Cora timucua. This is a new species. If you're reading that headline of the scientific article on the bottom left, a new and potentially ex extinct species in Florida. Um, so this is pretty exciting. And this museum specimen, it was first, uh, it was discovered or not discovered, but I should say um, the fact that it was something new was found out through a digitization project. These specimens are kept in cabinets in Florida, um, but once these specimens were digitized, a surrogate of them was put online with the location and the identity. Once that was put online, you could start to notice that, wait a minute, this is an outlier. The genus Cora was not previously known from the North, from North America, um, from the United States. Um, so the fact that some of these dots on a map appeared up here, you know, represent something interesting. Are they misidentified or are they really there? Because if they're really there, then what's going on? Um, so Manuela Dalforno was one of the researchers on this paper that described this, uh, this species as new to science. Um, Cora Timucua, named um, for the Timucua people in Florida that originally resided, the native peoples that resided in that place. Um, and its common name is a Timucua heart lichen. So publishing this species as new to science as discovered from 
herbarium specimens. That species hasn't been seen again for, for many years. So we're describing a species new to science, not from a newly discovered um, organism out in the wild, but from documented natural history collections. I would like to say that this is not you know, uh, I would like to say that 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 this doesn't uh, that this isn't always the way it happens, but unfortunately, it does. These natural history collections are repositories for many species that perhaps are already extinct that we won't see again. These natural history collections are important every step of describing that as a new species, whether it be plant or lichen. Um, on the right hand side, you're seeing that red um, banner in there. This is the IUCN Red List. This is the International Collaboration for assessing the status of conservation or the, the, the risk at which these uh, species are. Many species haven't been reviewed in any recent years, um, but Manuela del Forno was the lead, um, the lead participant on this, this uh, assessment. So you can see that published there. But this is how you can get involved. Um, so we're trying to find it. Right, so Manuela and her team are saying, let's see if we can refine it by harnessing all these naturalists, these people passionate and outside right now. So um, the specimen or the species hasn't been observed since 1968 to 1985, and it's known only from natural history collections, or um, which you can see images of here that have been rehydrated um, for capture here. So there is a challenge to find these and specifically through an app called iNaturalist. And I'll talk about that app at the end of this presentation. So what impact can you have in better understanding our natural heritage and ultimately conserving it? Well, two projects that you can independently get involved with. Uh, these are projects that are online or accessible by you that don't need any sort of permission to, to get in, um, except for whatever you might find on their own individual websites. They're free. Um, you do have to create an account for iNaturalist, but not from Notes from Nature. So I'll first talk about Notes from Nature, which is extracting data from images of natural history collections. So this is assisting us, assisting me in extracting data that already exists on specimens. The second thing I'll talk about is iNaturalist, is where you generate new data, photo tagged or geo tagged photographs of um, organisms. So this is iDigBio, our national integrated effort for digitizing collections. And you're looking at, anybody can access this, iDigBio.org. You can go to search the portal. And this is where many natural history collections are putting their data online. This is a heat map. So the, the red color denotes where collections are made of all taxa, so not just plants, but insects and fish and all sorts of things. And then this is how that process gets into a database like that. This is how it becomes, a specimen becomes usable for some of these larger research projects. So there's the first step of, of staging, selecting and repairing, pulling out of the cabinets and preparing a specimen for digitization. Well, what is digitization? Well, we consider it a three-step process, um, which is to image the specimen at high resolution, to then transcribe all the data off those labels. You saw that there's quite a lot of text on those specimens. And then lastly, to georeference those. Georeferencing means to take that description of location where that plant was collected and to apply a coordinate to it, um, a geo coordinate to show where on earth that plant was, a collect was collected with perhaps an associated degree of, of uncertainty. Um, so if it says it was collected in Fort Worth, well, where in Fort Worth? So let's, let's put a point in the middle of Fort Worth and let's kind of draw a shape around it to show it could have occurred anywhere in this area and then ultimately to publish it. This is how these studies become available to science. This is our digitization team here at BRIT. Um, what you don't see in this image are the many, many volunteers that work with us and make these projects possible. Um, some of whom I think are in attendance in the audience today. Um, it simply wouldn't be possible. 1.5 million specimens, there's not the funding nor the time for us to really get to those in any sort of timely manner. We need to make these data available now to these conservation efforts. Um, and it's not happening as fast as we'd like but it's happening faster because of you. You're making it possible. You can make it possible. Here's one example that was given at a presentation by Dr. Peter Fritsch, who's our director of research, our VP of research. And he was showcasing how digital preservation, these images can become really important as another way to preserve these plants. Um, what you're looking at on this screen is on the left, um, I'm sorry, well, on the left, you're looking at the current state of this particular specimen in here, 2021. Um, what you're looking on the right side 
is the state of that specimen, an image that was captured sometime prior to 2017, so 2015 or 16 perhaps. I don't know if you're able to see the inset image in those two specimens, but you're able to see that over the, that span of years from 2015 to 2021, um, those specimens experienced damage. This is a collection that we actually rescued um, uh, from another state and you can see that there was damage that happened to some of these specimens and although we can't that those flowers are gone. That's what you're looking at in the, those inset images. Those flowers are gone in the specimen today, but we can go back to those older original images and we can see those flowers. In some cases, we can make those identifications. Um, we can see the characters and the things that we need to see to, to know what it is. That doesn't always happen and it depends on the group that you're working with. So we have current digitization projects at, Grit, at BRIT. Uh, a lot of these are funded by the National Science Foundation, which is the abbreviation NSF there. One of them is digitizing endless forms most beautiful. So that's a Darwin quote. Um, and it's concentrating on um, digitizing specimens to facilitate research on um, plants that are imperiled. Um, that are at danger, at risk for extinction, that have extreme morphologies, extreme adaptations that allow them to live in some of these, these places. And I'm actually going to go to the next screen to show you one of our more recent projects that's funded by the National Science Foundation. This is a project to digitize specimens in the South Central United States, specifically in Texas and Oklahoma. As many of you that are that are tuning in from, from Texas here know, we have a very diverse, um, a, a biodiverse state uh, or an area, if you include Oklahoma as well, where we see some really incredible climatic uh, gradients, changes in moisture and soil type um, and heat and temperature. Um, and we have exceptional plant diversity. We have over uh, nearly 5,000 native species. Um, and about 31% of North American natives are represented in our two state region. So this grant is four years to digitize almost 2 million specimens collected in Texas and Oklahoma that come from 46 herbaria around the United States. And this is the project um, called Notes from Nature. This is a third party uh, software that you don't have to register to use. And I'm going to quickly show you the website where you can look at this. So let me change and let's show you. <clears throat> All right. So hopefully you're looking at a Google screen here. If you're not, then hopefully, Jen, please tell me. But I've just typed notesfromnature.org into the URL bar. And it's taken me, it's redirecting me to this website, but I can see I'm in the right place because it says notes from nature. If I click here on Torch, the Texas, Oklahoma, oops, consortium, regional consortium of Herbaria, you can click in here and it takes you to a project page. And then here you see Torch, Texas specimens from the NLU collection at Brit. Click in here and it takes you to a specimen. Now I've lined one up already here. And if you're looking at this specimen, and remember this is available to anyone, I'm not registered, am I? Oh, I am registered, I'm logged in. But everything you're seeing right now, you can do without being registered or logging in. So I'm looking at a spider wart. If you're familiar with that, I'm looking at a spider wart um, specimen and I'm looking around to look for all the labels. There are built-in tutorials here that you can, um, you can utilize. And then here I'm going into the primary label because this is what I'm asking you to think about helping us with. It's to take all the data that are on the sheet, this textual data and type it in. So I'm looking at this label and interestingly, it doesn't say United States of America, but I know because it says plants of Texas and I see limestone on there and costs, I know those places are in the United States. So I'm gonna make that assumption, United States it says plants of Texas. So I'm gonna put Texas in here and then it asks for the county. So you'll notice there's already a list in here for county. Now limestone is on this label, but it doesn't tell you that it is a county. My familiarity with labels tells me that that's a county, um, and it's also a, a good guess because it's separate from all the other data. The scientific name. Now, if you want to get familiar with scientific names and practice them, then here, let's see, flora. So I'm typing what I'm seeing on the label here. I'm not typing in the bush and there's a little more explanation in the tutorial that tells you why or why I'm not typing certain things in. But for the sake of time, I'm really gonna, gonna speed through this here. 
the location. So I'm looking for location. I've already recorded it's from Texas. I've already recorded it's Limestone County, but I see that there's five miles from, is that a K or an R? It looks like a K from Cos. The habitat, it doesn't actually tell me in here, but some labels you see might say it was collected in the middle of a stream. It was collected underneath an oak. It was collected in deep shade. Or it might say something like it was collected with and then list a bunch of other species of plants. So that's the kind of information I might record. Who is it collected by? This specimen was collected by Angela Mackey and the collector number, number 38. So I'm gonna type 38 and you can see that the number's right after her, um, her name. And then here's a nice date. There's no ambiguity, which is actually, oh, I'm sorry, month. So let's see, three, that's March the 27th and 1981. And then you'll notice here I can hit done or I can hit done and talk. There is a forum of really engaged people that can answer questions. Um, and that's one way you can do it if you're logged in. All right, so I'm going to go back to the presentation now and keep on trucking through. If you're interested in doing these specimen label transcriptions with us, you can find out more by going to the first website listed on here which is brit.org slash armchair botanist. If you're interested, we have public open conversations every Wednesday at noon. Make sure you check the calendar for, um, for any scheduling changes. But every Wednesday at noon central time, you'll find a, a Zoom conversation um, with other people that are transcribing. And we usually engage in discussions about plant identification, about the history, who collected these plants, where they collected them. So it becomes rather, rather interesting here. Okay, in the essence of time, I'm gonna move ahead and show you um, that we have these specimens that, like I said, go back maybe hundreds of years in time, but we have finite space to store them. We have finite time and funding to collect them. So we need to prioritize our efforts and we need to investigate other complementary strategies to better understand our flora. Let's use, use flora as the example. So here's one example, and many of you have probably heard about this. This is a really exciting um, application that anybody can do. Again, free. It's an app that you download to your phone or you can use on your computer. And approximating a more complete picture, highlighted the picture because it is a it is an application that uses geotagged photographs to, and puts them in an online accessible biodiversity database that anyone can use. And I'm gonna go to the next screen and I'm gonna start this video. It says it's screen recording and showing me capturing a observation. So once you've found the plant that you want to document, the first thing to do is to open up your iNaturalist app. So I'm going to my app screen, there's iNaturalist. And then I need to add a new observation. You can see a list of all the observations that I've added in the last couple of days. So let's hit the plus symbol down here and let's hit take a photo. So this is the plant that I would like to photograph. So you kind of want to look at your plant, look around, and then figure out how to get the best photograph of it, because that's going to be extremely important in somebody being able to identify your plant or you yourself being able to identify it. So, oh, that looks like a pretty good picture. I'm going to hold still so it's in focus. There we go. That, that looks pretty good. So I'm going to hit OK. But I know how hard it is to identify plants from just a single photograph. And I think that there could be some interesting things in the leaves or the back of the flower that might help people identify it. So I'm gonna hit on the plus symbol here again to add another photograph. And then let's see, I'm gonna take it from this side now because have a look now, you can see some other things that weren't visible before. Let's find a good, good picture in here. There we go. Take that picture. Looks like it's in focus. We're gonna keep that one. And then I think that the leaves are gonna be really diagnostic. So let's do this. Take a picture here. That looks like it's in focus. Not all the leaves are, but I think there's a good lot there that are visible. So let's hit all right. And then it allows me to fill in notes. So I'm gonna write on a slope by road. You don't have to write notes. I'm going to see, here's the next thing. What did you see? Well, let's click on that button. So that's actually helping me identify my plant. 
it gives me some choices. It says, we're pretty sure it's in this genus of the evening primroses, sun drops, and bee blossoms, which is the genus Enothera. Now the top suggestions for the photograph I've taken are listed below. And the top suggestion for this one is pink ladies, Enothera speciosa. I happen to know that that is the name for this species, so I'm gonna click on that. Now, if I wasn't sure and I just thought it was Enothera, I could click on that, but I know I'm pretty sure it's this species. Now, let's see. So that's a species. Well, visually, it looks like a match. Let's hit on the compare button. And then I can see the two pictures right side by side. I can scroll through my images. You know, I'm even more certain. Let's see. Is there a good picture of leaves on here? None of these pictures show me so far have good leaves. Now, that doesn't look like quite as close a match, but definitely think these earlier pictures were a match. So I'm going to go back over here. And then I'm going to say, yes, this is pink ladies. And I'm going to hit select. So now I've got my record with three photographs. I've got an identification for it. And you'll see that there's a date and time and there are coordinates for it. Is it captive or cultivated? That's really important because this plant was not planted here. Um, it grew up sort of as a weed. But this is also an app that you can use to document cultivated things, but it is important to list that in here. But it's not tapped in, it's not cultivated. I didn't plant it, I don't take care of it and water it. So I'm gonna leave that unchecked. I'm gonna hit submit. And there you go, you can see it's waiting to upload. Now it's uploading and let's let it pop in here. And it takes just a minute to do so. And it will keep working, you can open up the app later. So if it doesn't upload right there while you're in the field, you're, you're fine there. So let's see if it'll give me a notification when it does that. <clears throat> All right, well, I don't want to wait here because I'm, oh, well, there it goes. It uploaded it. So I'm gonna show you one that I captured a couple of days ago here. So this is the photograph that I took a few days ago and I'm gonna scroll down here and you can see that it's flowering and you can see that it's called research grade in here. What research grade means is that when I uploaded this, I only uploaded, I identified it to the genus level. So I called it Calyptocarpus. I didn't know what species it was, so I just left it at that. Well, Con, Con Lindago's ID came in and they said, I agree, it's Calyptocarpus, but it's Calyptocarpus vialis. That's the species. And then you can see Cheryl SR's ID also concurred. That means that my record, if we go, uh, oh, sorry, my apologies. If I go back here, my record is now considered research grade. That means it is a more reliable record that multiple people have agreed on the identification of my plant. That becomes a research grade observation, becomes a really useful tool for scientists. And it helps all of us in our field work in knowing what's happening right now. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with this app, but it is pretty spectacular. It's an app that I use when I'm going to a new place to get familiar with what are the plants that are that have been documented there through photographs and what are the plants that have recently been documented there or maybe in the month of April. So you're looking at a screen capture of um, Fort Worth and the Fort Worth Botanic Garden area of some of the captures. And if you look carefully, you can see that pink ladies, the Enothera speciosa that I recorded actually pops up in there as one of the more recent observations over here. So a great tool to teach you about plants in a way that allows you to contribute evidence-based, photo-based, evidence for the existence of these plants in space and time. Communities representing varied perspectives using multiple evidence-based strategies will gain us a better understanding of the things we do know and the things we don't know. Um, these tools to document and preserve our biodiversity are, are essential elements in, in, in our toolkit for conservation. And you really are a part of this and, and can choose to, to be a part of this. Um, that back to that original publication from earlier today, um, the importance of these collections cannot cannot really be overemphasized. Um, and I encourage you to, if you're curious, to go have a look at this this publication here. If you are interested and in you uh, in supporting your organization, if you want to find your local organization. Um, this is a global registry maintained by the New York Botanical Garden called Index Herbarium. So if you'd like to find a herbarium, see if there's an herbarium near you 
and support them by visiting or learn from them, um, then I encourage you to go to this website here. If you're not just death to plants, well, there's the International Biological Collections Registry that I showed earlier, and there's that website repeated here again. If you have decided that that Brit and the gardens here in Fort Worth is the place that you'd like to perhaps come and learn or participate um, in, well, then these are some of the contact information for some of the people that are producing these programs that you might be might be interested in. And I'd like to especially highlight that our Green Revolution program, which is an environmental STEM um, career learning program for teens, um, we have some pretty incredible activities coming up this summer, and, and of course year round, but especially coming up your, uh, this summer that's um, highlighted in that green box. And so um, currently seeking sponsorship and our partners and applicants. So if you have a junior volunteer, um, you know, somebody who's under age, younger than 18, uh, than 18, I believe it's 14 to 18, but please clarify that on our website, um, then I encourage you to, to, to teach them, to tell them about this program and come visit it a little bit more. This is the last slide I have, um, and it's just to say a big thank you. Oh, goodness. Hopefully you're still looking at the screen because my screen just went blank. We Jenner, just blank too. All right, well, let me see if I can, all right, how about that? Yep, now we can see it. Interesting. Let's see if I can go to presentation mode again. Huh, all right. Well, let's just make this as big as I can so you can see this last screen. Um, here we go. A big thank you to the Fort Worth Public Library, to all of you that have joined us today um, to hear about this, to those of you that may do it in the future by looking at the recording or watching the recording, um, and really to all the volunteers that help us work on all the projects we do um, around the world. These are some of the activities going on at BRIT, and I am happy to answer questions. We have maybe three minutes for questions, perhaps, um, but I'm certainly happy to stick on a little longer if you have, um, if you'd like to stay longer. So if you'd like to ask uh, Tiana a question, please post them in the chat. Um, and uh, we want to thank you for joining us today. If you, um, the recording will probably get posted within the next week to our YouTube page. Um, and after the presentation, you will receive an email uh, in the next, uh, probably today or maybe by Monday, uh, that will uh, be a survey. Um, we certainly would like you to tell us what you thought of this program and it helps us uh, to plan for future programs. I'm also going to put a link to that survey in the chat for you if you want to do it today and not wait for your email. Um, so it looks like we don't have any questions. So Tiana, I want to thank you very much. Oh, hold on. <laughs> so I'm curious how you work with the city of Fort Worth to help conserve some of our areas. That's an excellent question. And I know that um, I personally have not worked on any recent projects with the city of Fort Worth, but as many of you know, the gardens used to be part of that, um, part of the city of Fort Worth. It's now separate and we're now a combined organization with Brit. Um, so I would say that botanic gardens are an incredible repository of living collections. There's, um, there's a paper that came out last year talking about extinction rates in North America. And um, one of the things they did is, is one of the things they found was extinction rates are higher than we thought of, of North American plants here. Um, and they were able to find exam many examples of plants that are extinct in the wild, but are still maintained in our botanic gardens. Um, so I would say that's kind of a long-term collaboration um, with the city of Fort Worth. There have been many other smaller projects to look at restoration projects um, of riparian areas, perhaps, what sort of plants will mitigate that heavy flow of water, uh, but not any that I have been personally um, responsible for, but I'm sure there's many things I'm not remembering at the moment. And I will also add that our presenter from last week um, with, with the Native Plants Society also talked about some of these conservation areas. They have some conservation gardens and some things throughout the city. Um, so if you go to our YouTube page, I'll put a link in here uh, for you and watch her presentation. Uh, she actually gave a couple of areas where they're doing particularly prairie, um, some uh, prairie conservation. Yeah, and I would say that, yeah, Lori, those are really great questions that you're putting in the chat there. And, you know, there's also, we've been working a lot more with um, urban ecology, not just the city of Fort Worth, but with also local ranchers, um, with GBRC Ranch. Um, and there's been some really incredible uh, relationships there because those are ranchers are preserving these, you know, large 
areas, you know, properly done, there's a way to, to conserve some of these areas in a way that benefits um, all of us. So lots of, lots of exciting partnerships and not enough time to talk about them today, but, um, but I'm certainly happy to answer any questions if we didn't get to them. And you can email me at traymond.org or herbariumatbrit.org. Thank you all for attending. I really appreciate your time. Yes, thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Happy Earth Day. Yes, happy Earth Day. Thank you.